it is a pleasure, of course, to to give a, uh, some some uh, some return something to the uh, TLU community that has, of course, being one of the founding places of my intellectual career. The discussions there with uh, different people have, of course, contributed not only to this book but a few books uh, before this as well. Uh, uh, the Corona times, of course, make uh, things a little bit more difficult to arrange uh, physically. Uh, so the embodied interactions are uh, going to be uh, something that we are going to be missing for for the future months, and and, and uh, even the travel between Helsinki and Tallinn is a little bit difficult nowadays because it's, it would entail ten days of quarantine both ways. Uh, and that uh, that is not perhaps what uh, how we want things to proceed but uh, today i will be talking to you about thaisidides kind of a neoclassical interpretation of thaisidides the famous historian of the peloponnesian wars uh, the war between sparta uh, lacemon and and then then athens uh, how the sea power of Athens was facing the rise of Sparta and, and how that led into what Thaisidides calls uh, Kinesis Magister. Kinesis Magister refers to uh, a great movement of things, basically a kinetic force that was unparalleled, as like, uh, Thaisidides says in the introductory remarks, that was unparalleled in the history so far. So he sees war, hegemonic struggle, as a as a movement, uh, a stirring movement uh, of things. I, I, I think that if you read Thaisidides very carefully, you go deeper into the layers of metaphorical layers of the uh, work. You can clearly see that he is actually referring to a movement of sea, movement of, uh, of uh, water. And in, 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 in a more tangible way, he was referring to vortex, vortexticity, you know, spiraling downwards movement of things. And, and Thaisidides is emphasizing how regressive process is not progressive, uh, pro pro progressive as we understand them to be nowadays in political science, for example. But regressive forces grab hold to emotional and rational side of people and uh, draw them underneath the sea level to this uh, all engulfing, spiraling downwards, uh, spiraling vortexicity that he. Uh, describes in the Peloponnesian uh, history or, or the account and of what we nowadays understand a war. So I, I took that neoclassical starting point, kind of the regressive spirals of, of uh, interaction as a model in, on, uh, in order to understand what is contemporarily happening between great powers and how small powers in inevitably become engulfed in the processes, uh, in the movement, movements and stirring movements caused by the greater powers. So very neoclassical uh, approach, uh, starting from uh, landscape, mental landscape of Thaisidides and applying that into present day understanding of the uh, conflict between uh, what I, what I Call autocratic governments and democratic governments, and this is relatively easy because fundamentally the war in Greece, the Peloponnesian War, was between uh, what was back then called democracy, Athens, and a more uh, uh, autocratic but still uh, republican Sparta. So that that, that there is certain resemblances and family resemblances between now and then. Uh, and uh, using neoclassical starting points is not perhaps very, uh, very uh, unheard of 
because if you look into the regressions instead of progressions, it usually makes sense to go to the classics because the modern modern uh, theories uh, uh, usually do not account for regressions as well as they do account for progressions. Even uh, uh, topics like revolutions are not handled as regressive processes, but as a history shaping, history, tri history driving processes in political history. So what I wanted to achieve was through this neoclassical approach, uh, sensitivity, nuanced sensitivity towards what it means for a political co community to regress. And that regression happens in stages. And one of the key uh, ideas of the book is that it never happens in a vacuum. So if you have regressive political entity somewhere, a state, for example, uh, like Somalia, Syria, if, if state is regressing, falling into parts, factions are growing, uh, violence results, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It draws in other participants. Uh, if it's less serious regression, perhaps the American democracy is regressing and we have been witnessing that and the book actually is a count of that, that American version of political regression. When democracy regresses towards kind of a nominal democracy, then even in those cases, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Other democracies are involved intensively in the American processes. And also as the um, election meddling case 2016, where the Russian, uh, Russian intelligence services were actively participating in American elections, you can see how the regression of the Russian state towards more uh, vertical types of autocracy cause, motivates them to meddle in, uh, in, in American uh, elections. So regressions uh, couple, they unite, and uh, uh, they do not happen in vacuums. And that also the overall coupling of different regressions leads into a situation where also the healthier communities can be participants of the overall regressive processes. They cannot stay out of it. Uh, I conceptualize uh, in my book, you know, Thysidides is often used uh, author nowadays. This neoclassical approach that I'm applying in here is uh, by no means uh, something that is very rare and uh, it, it is by no means my invention. Uh, uh, most of you have heard about Thysididian trap, uh, a, a term that has been coined by a couple of uh, very famous political scientists. Uh, Thysididian trap refers to uh, a statement, a sentence in the history, in the book by Thysididis, uh, where he says that what made war inevitable was the growth of Athenian power and the fear which this caused in Sparta. And in that one sentence, he, uh, Thysidides basically described what was the cause, what were the rational and the irrational causes of the overall kinesis machista. And then the question becomes, is this trap, you know, when two actors become coupled in a spy downward spiraling regressive process. Is that type of trap happening today between China and US? And that, is, that has been one of the main topics that many of the authors of international relations ha has been uh, uh, entertaining and, and making uh, articles and op-eds uh, policy relevant. Uh, work on this topic. So how can Thysidides writing 2,500 years ago enlighten us on the processes and dynamics between the great powers uh, uh, currently, US and China? Are there certain similarities? Is there a trap that uh, is set to happen and the, which is very difficult to, to correct? Henry Kissinger only two days ago, uh, old, uh, 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 American 
uh, minister of state or foreign minister as they are known in Europe uh, in 1970s uh, during the Nixon administration. He still is very much alive and still very much giving advices to American administrations. And he was saying that Joe Biden administration has to immediate, immediately re-engage with, uh, with China in order to correct this downward spiraling uh, uh, regression because war can result and war between two great powers in the nuclear age uh, of course is not something that is very desirable for any participant of the international uh, community. So that uh, Thysidian trap is one of the key concepts that, that is used. It is very well known, uh, but I do not use that in my book. There's another Thysidian concept that I myself coined. Uh, at least I cannot uh, find that when I Google around by, by anybody else. And that has to do with a Thysidian brink, a cliff. Uh, that is uh, in front of us. So Thysididian Brink refers to a situation where regression inside a political community becomes inevitable. So it cannot heal itself anymore. It cannot correct its way anymore. And uh, um, the key concept Thysididian Brink in my book has to do with uh, US currently. So is it somehow regressing to a point where it cannot anymore heal its democratic processes, where it cannot unite itself, where the polarization is so deep that it inherently is incapable of becoming one single uh, yeah, unifying entity. And this is very important because if we think about these wider international consequences of regression, then of course the regression of, of uh, the largest military power, the largest economy in the world, uh, it has implications. So regression of the US that doesn't happen in a vacuum. No regression happens in a vacuum, but in particularly if we are talking about political regression in the US, it has worldwide repercussions and implications. And we should think about that. So what is then uh, Thysidian uh, brink? A point, critical point, uh, that uh, beyond which uh, uh, things are not ideal for any democracy. So it is a point where the internal cohesion becomes weakened weakened uh, to the point that political bonds are rather formed with outside actors, like with Russian actors, Ukrainian actors, with Turkish actors, with Chinese actors, with outside actors and elements that uh, then with domestic actors. And when the enmity felt uh, towards internal political competitors becomes stronger than the enmity felt towards traditional geopolitical enemies. So at that point, when the uh, community finds that the internal political struggle, for example, that uh, what was previously considered to be legitimate political processes like elections, are uh, threatening to a degree uh, that is not matched by uh, the outside uh, en enemies uh, that, that uh, a country or state traditionally has. So, for example, 2016, asking if it happened, we do not know if it happened, but uh, um, the term collusion is a good example of this. If collusion happened in US elections, uh, asking for illegitimate foreign help, uh, or perhaps not directly asking, but uh, in a way receiving uh, or benefiting from uh, uh, illegitimate foreign help, and facilitation, then that is, a, of course, a sign that political competitors in that particular election of 2016, that the uh, Democratic Party candidate Hillary Clinton was seen more as an enemy than uh, the outside actors. So when repression happens, the very boundary between 
domestic and foreign becomes problematized. So actually, you do not know, the actors do not know anymore who belongs to the V community, the national V community, and who is outside of it, and uh, uh, who is an enemy of that V community in a geopolitical sense. So things become fuzzy, they become blurred from, uh, from what they used to uh, be. And this is something that I'm questioning that might have happened in the US case uh, 2016, uh, that it is uh, part of a longer process of polarization, regression uh, is part of that process. But I take perhaps the story a little bit beyond uh, merely accounting for uh, how uh, polarization has uh, risen in US because of the culture wars uh, over the decades, uh, especially since 1980s. I take the story a little bit beyond that type of uh, very customary modern uh, uh, way of handling the American uh, regression or po political weakening of, of, of America. I try to use this uh, older conceptualizations, neoclassical conceptualizations about political friendship, for example, the Aristotelian understanding of different types of political friendship and, and how uh, that can be weakened by, uh, for example, demagogic uh, uh, popular, uh, popul populist uh, politics. So what Thysidides valued in his writings and many of the classical authors valued in, his, uh, in their writings was a constant steady movement of, uh, of the community. Kind of the perfection of the community when it came uh, to its ability to maintain uh, certain uh, possibilities, opportunities for good life, for a particular selection of uh, members of the communi community called the citizens of, of a particular community. So kind of a being part of the friendship, political friendship, uh, meant uh, that, that uh, there was an active element uh, constitutive element that was shared by members of that community. One key aspect of this sharedness had to do with a similar type of political memory. Memory was a key, according to Thysidides, for healthy uh, uh, community. He uses the term enkratia to refer to a healthy uh, political uh, community. Uh, and then Kratia had to do with basic uh, premises being there for, for opportunities for, for happy life. Um, and of course, regression then refers to disappearance of those political bonds of friendship that are needed in order to maintain uh, ordered community within. Uh, Thysidides uh, uses the term human space or political space in a highly virtuous uh, manner. He, he values the maintenance of uh, human space uh, very actively and he sees politics as a way uh, of doing that. What you need to do is that you need to maintain and uh, broaden the human community. So on the one side, you have the laws of the jungle that are constantly trying to get into the community. And those laws of jungle uh, refer to uh, uh, the, the rules and logic of, of, of power and anarchy. So uh, the war basically is getting closer to the community in, in the geographical and in temporary sense. So the longer time there has been from previous war, the shorter the time is for the next war. That was basically Thysidides' point. Kind of a, also uh, referring back to what Plato uh, once stated, that uh, every generation is going to feel war. And war, war is the uh, birthplace of uh, human morality. Kind of a ne very neoclassical, uh, uh, classical ways of understanding uh, also the virtuous nature of war. So war is felt, it is always present and it, it, 
it is the other boundary of the political community. And a well-maintained and governed community can guard that, can defend the community in case of war, or can try to uh, avoid a war if it's not needed. So uh, war doesn't enter into, and violence doesn't enter into the political community. And the other side had to do with accidents, different types of accidental occurrences. Things can happen that are sudden, surprising, unexpected, and inherently negative. Uh, accidents like uh, uh, diseases, pandemics. Thysidides is one of the first great authors who actually accounts for pandemics uh, in, in, in his book. He has a narrative, a very famous sub-narrative of the plague of Athens. It happens because of the war, during the war, because the uh, governance of Athens is failing. It is not able to check the war that is, it is participating actively. The passions of war are running high. And because of that, the weakening of the bonds of political friendship, it is unable to prevent the plague from entering into Athens. So plague, uh, pandemic, or epidemic, uh, as it was back then, uh, is a sign of a bad governance. Dur during the wartime, it happens. Pestilences usually are connected, not only by Thysidides, but uh, by other authors in history as well. So plague is a portent, a signifier of bad governance, of, of the overall downwards sloping regressive vortex that, that is happening in the, in the, in the, between the communities, uh, has also that type of aspect to it. And uh, in my book, uh, I also point that out, that besides all the other aspects of repression being present in the US, the uh, US also became kinless, ruderless, uh, leaderless when it became the handling of the COVID-19. Of course, democracies are facing huge problems in this respect all over the world, uh, but still, U.S. has been able to handle pandemic situations before. In the 80s, uh, HIV AIDS uh, was dealt very uh, effectively, uh, not only inside the U.S., but there were famous 1990s and 2000s programs in Africa in order to prevent the spread of, of the syndrome. Uh, similarly, 2015, uh, the Ebola epidemic in, in, in Western Africa was, was checked actively by American leadership. They were participating actively in checking the disease in Western Africa at the point of origin where it can actually be checked. Of course, now this theme, theme is one of the themes in the book that takes us back also to, to US-China relations. So you have this uh, Thysidian brink, the American regression, the political regression, actively linking with the other important Thysidian concepts, the Thysidian trap. You know, the passions, uh, irrational passions uh, but that are gradually uh, being built between China and US. You know, the fear that the rise of China elicits in Washington and uh, uh, the fear uh, that uh, US uh, uh, arises in, in, in China how those combine can also be seen in the COVID-19 case, how uh, disease came from, from malpractices and bad governance in China. It was contributed by bad governance, global bad governance by various actors, but also by the uh, uh, US not being present when it came to global leadership. So uh, COVID-19 is one of the windows it gives you one window, one perspective to look into what can be meant by, by increasing political regression, overall political reason, uh, regression that is widening when it comes to global uh, scope of it and then deepening in certain states, particularly in US, but also in autocratic states.
one of the premises of the book is that there's a scale of repression. And actually, you know, healthy democracies are relatively stable uh, uh, communities. We still have those. Although the, uh, the wave of democratization that started, uh, the fourth wave of democratization that started in the 1970s, that is now coming to an end gradually. The number of democracies is, is starting to decline and also uh, the quality of democracies is starting to, to come down as well. But we still have uh, uh, healthy demo uh, democracies. Not all the democracies are, are nominal or becoming nominal, like uh, I'm proposing US might be uh, turning into a democracy in name only. Um, but of course, behind, behind that brink, when things uh, go to wrong directions, when a democracy, for example, turns into autocracy, like what happened in, in Hungary, perhaps, or might, might happen in, in Poland, what happened in Russia, is that they might be kind of a solidifying, although the state is regressing, there's a solidifying effect because it is centering around particular central authority, a party, a faction, uh, a particular V community that takes over other uh, opposition forces. Of course, the community is more diseased. This is uh, uh, politically repressed, uh, repressed community, but it might feel that it has more power because it can, one faction of the community, they can now, under our autocratic situation, use all the resources of the state. And uh, that gives uh, a sudden jolt of energizing power to a particular regime. So beyond the brink, beyond the Thysidian brink, you actually might have um, something that uh, resembles, uh, re uh, resembles a solid political community, but uh, is solid only on the face of it. Underneath what you have is actually uh, expulsion of elements from the, from the state. So the V community constricts, it feels more secure because it becomes tighter and more solid, but uh, there's of course elements, opposition elements that are now left to, to the margins and outside of the community that then participate uh, in the uh, weakening of the solidness of the autocracy ultimately. So then, then there might be auto, uh, a regression beyond this strong autocracy to weakening autocracy and uh, even beyond autocracy, uh, 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 you can uh, have places like Syria, Somalia, uh, Iraq, you know, kind of a black holes, anti-communities, where the constitutive element is no longer shared friendship, but it is shared hatred, hatred towards uh, uh, what used to be your fellow compatriots. So instead of, of uh, feeling any sense of sadness, friendship and empathy towards them or V communality. Uh, the V communality turns into anti-communality whereby the internal war is uh, the constitutive element of the community. And those communities usually actively invite outside participants and only great powers that are in, uh, internally repressing are motivated, irrationally motivated to participate through interventions in the uh, anti-communal interactions in these places. So from this perspective, for example, the Russian intervention in Syria, in the internal uh, collapse of the Syrian state, actually is a sign of irrational regression inside Russia. So Russia couldn't help itself. We usually give a logical rational explanation to that activity but in my book uh, i make the point that that uh, uh, if the overall context is so disturbed so regressive so downward sl sloping then uh, rationality of course uh, is non-existent and what drives also great power behavior is not logical but, but the complexity of the situation and the irrationality that that brings with it. Okay, so um, just a few more remarks on the 
on the book and then I will yield the floor for, for questions. Um, one of the key aspects of the book has to do with the meddling itself and a technical, technical uh, uh, sides to that. So, so how you can internally meddle in and influence other states' activities. Uh, this is a literature, a body of literature that, that is very long, uh, very traditional. There has always been talk about fifth columnists, uh, enemy aliens, you know, bad elements inside the city, uh, inside the city gates or inside the state that kind of pollute uh, the state, uh, its citizens, uh, citizens uh, and, and of course havoc inside the community. So enemy has presence inside uh, uh, different countries. This, the, this uh, rules of this type of uh, narration in research are very long. Uh, you can go all the way to the different descriptions of how Roman Empire fell, how the city gates of Rome were opened up to, to Attila and, and who did that. So who conspired within the city uh, with enemies outside of the city. And this is the debate that still, this is debate that are, is very much present with us, especially in, in communities that feel that they are regressing. Uh, there is a projection of the fear of regression to foreign elements very easily. So there's quite a lot of xenophobia, for example, for this reason. You know, foreigners are seeing as agents of Russia or immigrants are seen as, as agents of uh, ISIS. Uh, so, so there's a seed of this uh, very, uh, very omnipresent way of, of thinking. So when we think about ways of meddling, uh, the histories of meddling are very ancient and, and, uh, and, uh, and the cl classical sources also give descriptions of, of these. Uh, but in my book, I concentrate on the digital side of things. So how digital platforms that are relatively open, that do not have the seams uh, that uh, uh, the political map of the world has. So the seamlessness of the digital realms uh, can lead into situations, can facilitate and catalyze external meddling. And 2016 is a very good case of that. So kind of a, a very basic operation by Russian military intelligence uh, led into uh, outcome that uh, likely was enough to change uh, uh, one uh, likely uh, factor that was changing the U.S. elections 2016. The elections were very close, so there were several different factors that influenced the outcome of the elections. But uh, but it, uh, at least in Russia, and for Russia, Russian government, it gave a particular cause for pride and also jubilation uh, when they were actively present in democratic processes, the most critical processes. In, in US. The question then, bigger question, uh, had to do with the collusion inside uh, Trump campaign and, and uh, the Mueller investigations found no evidence of, of collusion. And uh, of course that is something that, that we have to, uh, it is the most authoritative, most, most detailed examination of this link between Russian uh, election meddling that is very known and, and, and is a fact and then uh, the possible collusion, collusion by, uh, but because of le legal reasons was not uh, uh, for uh, Robert Mueller, the investigator was not evident that it had fulfilled the legal requirement for, for illegal collusion. But collusion, of course, if we, talk, we are talking about kind of an extroversion of community, and for your domestic political enemies becoming more of, more of enemies than the geopolitical foes and enemies uh, that traditionally the country has had, then of course collusion is ultimate measure of that. So we don't know what happened in US 2016. We will know perhaps more after January 20th when the administration is going to change hands. Uh, but still there, were, there was a pattern of digitally yeah, and, and uh, digital operations based on the 
Pack and Leap type of, of uh, operations. The US elections 2017, uh, there was successful Hack and Leap operation, you know, stealing of Hillary Clinton's emails or the campaign emails uh, through social engineering uh, operation, the password for the email server was gained and, and those were leaked through third parties, namely WikiLeaks, into, into US uh, media and even the mainstream media in US was publishing week after week scandalous news of uh, deriving from the emails of, of Democratic Party campaign. Uh, then the next elections uh, that took place, important uh, Western elections, that I detail in my book is 2017 French presidential elections. Same operation by same actor, uh, Russian military intelligence was attempted in, in the French uh, final, final days of the French elections. Uh, so the uh, Macron campaign email, emails were hacked and uh, there were leaking of that information to French media. Um, that was a little bit different because uh, there was also fake content. So the old, all the content was not original from the Macron campaign, but it, there was also infusion of fake content into uh, video images and other materials. And the other difference was that because the French uh, authorities had learned already from the American case, uh, they, uh, they managed to stop the publishing of the information, the negative information uh, on the Macron campaign and the French media was very active in this respect and responsible as well. So the American media 2016 was thinking that all newsworthy items that are leaked should be published, where the uh, French media uh, 2017 was thinking that you have to know the intent, why these, why these materials were leaked in order to uh, them to be newsworthy. So, so the intent became important. So if the intent is to derail the campaign of a particular candidate in a democratic elections, then you do not publish. You don't need to publish that information. And the last uh, in this hack and leak type of uh, election meddling activities and operations was a German uh, parliamentary elections 2017, uh, Russian, uh, intelligence services had penetrated the email system of uh, Bundestag, uh, the, the, the um, uh, parliament of, of Germany, and uh, they had perfectly leakable information, uh, sensitive, sensitive information on, on particular major candidates in the, in the German elections. But that uh, information was never leaked. It wasn't, so the, the, uh, the attempt to uh, meddle in with the German elections was, uh, 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 didn't, uh, it, it wasn't pulled through. So it was uh, discontinued. So there, there was kind of a 2016 successful American uh, election meddling operation. Uh, bad experiences from the French uh, elections 2017, and then the failure of that method in, in 2016 for a German case. So, Actually, you can see the decline of this hack and leak type of uh, meddling and or, or hybrid influence operation. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest victims of the 2020 US elections was hack and leak operation. There was one attempted hack and leak operation run by a good, uh, good friend of uh, Donald Trump President Donald Trump, uh, ex-mayor of New York, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, who had uh, presumably uh, gained access to, to Joe Biden's son's emails that somehow showed uh, Biden in a bad light when it came to Ukraine and, and China. But the American uh, media uh, did not fall into the same trap again. So uh, that uh, information was considered to be mostly fake, mostly unreliable, and it was not newsworthy anymore. So in four years, actually quite a lot of things had changed. And that could be a sign that the American democracy is not as we, it's not as close to the Thaisididian brink as we think uh, it might be. So the, it is polarized, 
but the institutions are still working, there's still a common sense, common sensical understanding of what it means to be American. Uh, so the border between uh, domestic and foreign is not that fuzzy, perhaps, than, than it seemed to be in 2016. Perhaps the patterns of collusion are not all over the place. Uh, but still, we have to be uh, wary of, 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 of this situation. And also, taking a smaller state perspective, you know, when Thaisidides writes the introduction to, to Peloponnesian War, the history of Peloponnesian War, he uh, states in the introduction that he is writing this for all of the generations to come. Because the same pattern that happened back then can happen again and again. You know, the emergence of this kinesis machista out of the confusion, regressive uh, processes, a contagion of regression happens, and 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 uh, things can get out of hand in a serious uh, manner for for years and years to come. Um, so uh, Thaisidides describes this uh, this. Uh, this process, how it uh, comes by. And I, I think it is fair for us uh, to consider always how our age, how our time and place fits into, into this pattern, overall dynamic, this diagnostic, uh, political diano diagnostic that uh, Thaisidides gives and the pro horrible prognosis that he uh, paints in the book, how our time and age fits to that. And for a smaller state, it is important to note that that uh, Thaisidides' prognosis is even worse than it is for bigger states. You know, Athens and Sparta, uh, the war went on for decades and decades, but they managed to survive in so, uh, one way or another. But the smallest uh, places, and uh, particularly he describes the uh, case of city-state of, of Korkyra, the stasis of Korkyra, uh, where the slaughter basically ended the existence of the community. Uh, it is much more horrible uh, for smaller states. So actually we in Finland and Estonia have much more to gain from the insights uh, given by Thaisidides uh, when he was uh, describing these this, uh, patterns of violence and regression. And also what I think, uh, final word here, what I, I think we should, as political scientists, uh, much more pay attention to is regression, political regression. We have, um, because of the modernization and secular, secularization paradigms being so much to the heart of social sciences, we have uh, perhaps been too, uh, too much in love with, uh, with the idea of progress and the inevitability of progress. And that can be one component, paradoxically, of regression that might happen when you are not preparing for regressive alternatives. Uh, they might be more potent, more likely than, than, than in the case that, that they are acknowledged and recognized as possible paths that the future can take. But I will uh, end here. Uh, uh, that was about 50 minutes, so, so perhaps there's time for questions. Okay, thank you, Mika, uh, for this interesting presentation. And uh, yes, now uh, I open the floor uh, for questions, so let's try to do it one at a time. Uh, just turn on, uh, switch on your camera and, and sound. So. Questions, comments. Who wants to start? Well, I can see Marilise. Yeah, hi. I um, thank you very much for your presentation, and the book sounds really enticing. Um, my questions are still a bit uh, fuzzy, uh, maybe, but just a few thoughts that kind of emerged for me. First of all, uh, 
I think that, um, am I correct in assuming that your take on what democracy is and what the decline of democracy is, is slightly different from perhaps mine or that of political science or this kind of regime logic. To me, it seems that you're talking about the regression of democracy in terms of um, d democratic autonomy or the autonomy of you know, uh, nation states or something like that and not necessarily democracy in terms of how people can influence the governance processes and so on. Uh, because I, I, you know, I would oppose that the regression of democracy in the United States, I don't know, started with the Jim Crow laws. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, well, excellent question. I mean, you know, vital kind of underlying remark. Um, so basically, when, it, when I take the neoclassical uh, perspective uh, into, into present-day democracies, kind of the scale of things is a little bit different. And uh, Marilis, you quite rightly pointed out that I'm not talking about you know, accountability, transparency, participation, engagement. Uh, what I'm talking about are processes that are thought to be kind of a constitutive uh, for democracies like uh, uh, like election processes and how those uh, proceed, uh, so without any any uh, disruptions, especially foreign uh, interference in the election. So I'm I'm not talking about uh, democracies in the ideal sense of the word. Although there is a there is a classification in the book, uh, kind of a basic classical separation between encratia akrasis and, and stasis, uh, you know, basically Enkratia referring to healthy situation where there's a agreement among the citizens on, on the legitimacy of particular uh, way of life. Uh, and in, in, in the present uh, day and age, uh, I associate that with democracies, that there's a body of evidence globally that democracies still are appealing, although they might be regressing, but the idea of democracy still appeals to, to, to people. And then uh, a crisis where, uh, you know, power takes hold and stops this kind of a, a renewal uh, process uh, uh, from carrying itself out, where, where power and particular individual interests override the interest of the community. And, and, and those I see as autocratic tendencies and, and, and uh, associate those with autocracies. And then stasis, of course, you know, that kind of a collapse of, uh, of uh, 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 borders of a state, uh, uh, for confusion between uh, foreign and, and, and domestic, uh, you know, uh, kind of a black holes of, of, uh, of political order, anti-communality. Uh, so so that, that, that is the basic kind of a uh, Richter scale. Actually, I have six different degrees of of of, of um, health, political health, and and and, and uh, healthy democracies being on top of, of 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 the listing. But by by no means it is meant to be a study on on the state of uh, democracy. It is much more so a study on 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 patterns whereby regression uh, can become contagious. Okay. Um, I will ask one more question. Um, uh, usually, realist theories uh, do not leave much room for agency, but what's your take on the role of leadership, for instance, in, uh, in you know, verging back from the Ticadidian brink? So um, I think Trump's personality has gotten way more attention maybe than it deserves. Uh, but it, uh, what got me thinking is that uh, Barack Obama recently published his new uh, monograph uh, where he very much kind of contemplates over his own leadership style and in being this kind of a soft reformist leader, not, you know, going with this kind of radical uh, innovative ideas, but rather looking for this kind of balance between, you know, the more conservative, realist uh, advisors and these optimistic idealist advisors. So would that type of leadership be, in your understanding, beneficial for, uh, you know, coming back from this Ticadidian brink? Or is it, uh, you know, rather something that could um, 
in, induce more problems. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, healing words, those are important. It's uh, very important. And uh, in the US, one of the most civil religious traditions you have in a, in a very heterogeneous country is presidency. Mm -hmm. And if presidency is not using healing rhetoric, um, uh, kind of uniting uh, words, then, then of course it might signal very deep regression because, you know, the country doesn't have many uniting institutions. Uh, it doesn't have shared culture ethnicity or, or, or religion like many other countries have but still it has uh, 320 million people it's one of the fastest growing countries by demographic uh, demographics it's becoming younger it is restless it's agitated it is polarized so it, it would be good that you have a person who can use uh, healing words and you know Thysidides uh, uh, of course uses the, the Athenian leader Pericles as a, as a good example of a person who can use words to heal uh, rifts. And, 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 and I think Obama tries to mimic himself along those way, uh, that way. Uh, Trump, of course, is an exception. You know, he, he is not part of this side of, 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 of uh, healing words. And, and uh, he doesn't even try to try to uh, persuade people through establishing a unified uh, resource of persu for persuasion. You know, rhetoric is not uh, alone standing, long standing words of speeches, like my lecture in here or presentation in here is not a long standing thing. There has to be a body of lectures before it in order for this to make sense. So, so uh, for Trump, uh, he's an innovator because there's not that much in the US for his kind of, of political leadership. And, and, and there's a cream, there's a cream uh, attraction in his way of doing things. And that, that creaminess I, I describe in my book as, a, as, as the cream pool of American uh, vulnerability. You know, we are following, at least in Finland, I don't know uh, how it is in Estonia, but every morning newscast, every evening newscast for the past year was about American elections. Mm. Uh, well, there was a brief interval because, you know, COVID-19 happened. So for two months, we didn't follow the American elections. But then, you know, Black uh, Lives Matter took over. That was the first thing that, that kind of a, in a news cycle took over from the coronavirus. Uh, so uh, there's something that is very attractive in vulnerability mm -hmm. and in regression, and it has a power that, uh, that you know, Trump has that power of causing vulnerability, and it, it should not be underestimated. It is a regressive power, and, and we should not uh, somehow think that it suddenly now disappeared when Joe Biden won. It did not disappear. It's still there. Well, he's not completely, uh, you know, uh, unprecedented. I think he's even cited himself that Andrew Jackson is one of his kind of like role models for him. But you're very much right that these kind of Republican systems are probably more vulnerable to these types of uh, crisis than more, you know, authoritarian cultures. But I'll yield the floor. Good. Are you up for a question or? Uh... Yes. Okay. Uh, just to follow up, thank you, Mika, for your presentation. Uh, what I was uh, wondering is that um, you talk about vulnerability, uh, and I wonder whether, you know, uh, even if you focus on, as you said, you, you focus on one aspect, on basically, you know, the election process, you know, uh, uh, as I got it, uh, I still wonder, like, uh, talking about vulnerability that, uh, you know, that Trump is still a symptom of this uh, kind of uh, inequality that has been building, like th that has been built. So somehow like uh, Obama was a more kind of eloquent uh, representation of still kind of the same inequality was in place, racism, white supremacy, uh, but it was kind of um, presented in more kind of uh, uh, elitist and you know uh, uh, representable way versus Trump 
So I'm wondering, like in your analysis, you know, kind of looking at irrational regression or just regression, like how do these uh, kind of structural matters um, uh, uh, play into, you know, how you do this analysis? I don't know yeah. if that makes sense, but... It, it does very much so. I think it's, it's a good... Good question, kind of the contributors of, 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 of polarization. Uh, you quite right to refer to the kind of the anti-elitist sentiments being one of the roots, both in the right and in, in, in left, for, for uh, kind of a, uh, resigning from, from, from the common uh, society and having more revolutionary, more reactionary uh, types of political action. You know, Trump is reactionary. He's a revolutionary. He's not a conservative uh, by no means. He's not a conservative president. Uh, he's a reactionary president. He reacts against the establishment, liberal elites. And then, uh, of course, there are other movements that are also reacting against this established status quo, uh, which they can see that is, for example, uh, structurally racist. So there's quite a lot of different groups that are targeting um, what Thaizididis uh, would call factions uh, that are targeting and becoming agitated when it comes to the established American civil religion. And I'm not here talking about ideals. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about civil religion as a constitutive element uh, of, of a particular uh, country, in this case, US. It is conservative. The civil religion it has established traditions, and uh, and I'm I'm not uh, talking about the justice or justness of that particular established way of of, of uh, behaving. But it seems that there's more and more factions that are critical towards this established nature, and that that kind of a supports the argument of, of of regression happening. You know, the sharedness of American constitutive element is less and less. Uh, broad. It is becoming more and more narrow. And there's clearly now kind of a two uh, or, or even more than two uh, main factions that are classing. Uh, so the culture wars are having more participants than it used to be. So it is not like when I was studying at Columbia University back in 1990s, early 1990s, it was clear that it is conservatives versus liberals. But now it's this kind of the reactionary, the revolutionary, uh, the radical, the liberal, uh, uh, the conservative. And it's very difficult to you know, anymore know who is who. And that is one of the clear symptoms of, of uh, uh, repression that, that you actually do not know anymore, these camps that are, they are not defined by the positive ingredients, the policy proposals, but they are defined by the being anti something else kind of a negative substance of the political movement, defines the political movement so more so than, 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 than uh, some positive uh, contributor, contribution. And these elections, one might also argue that, for example, Joe Biden's basic message and agenda mandate was always set out by Donald Trump's uh, theatrical circus-like uh, behavior. So what people actually gave a mandate to in these elections, it's very difficult to know. Uh, they clearly reacted against particular uh, circus-like character. But, but uh, is that mandate for governing US for the next uh, four years and in what way? But it, it was a good question, but I, I, I try not to perhaps take a stance, stand on that particular topic. And uh, you can uh, be critical of this kind of a historical Thaisididian kind of a cyclical understanding uh, of, of things. Uh, and then the agency question also, um, so it was asked before, you know, like in the progressive times, in the times of, of political health, when the status quo is prevailing and I, there's a sense of direction, then, you know, agency is empowering those who support the status quo. In times of regression, it is empowering those who, the agency of those who perhaps are um, trying to hijack the V communal element or the V community or then 
uh, at the ultimate uh, uh, stages of, of stasis when the society is collapsing those people who are empowered are the, uh, the moments who are empowered are, are those who can actually replace the existing faction or the main faction with their own own uh, own uh, political uh, political interests just a, just a quick remark here uh, i think that the, what you're referring here as a reactionary is usually what is defined as, as populist uh, uh, politics in the sense of as, uh, people versus establishment uh, constructing this cleavage uh, as dichotomously as as possible yeah. is kind of and then the, the, the Kedidian, I, I, and i think mari is also used this ancient greek uh, uh, spelling yeah. the, the Canadian uh, kind of uh, time uh, the, the, these people were called demagogues uh, by most political theory uh, yeah demagogues I, I mean when, it, when we talk about uh, Thucydides you know one of the measures of political health is the lack of, of demagogues mm -hmm. because demagogues then they can make proposals you know they can externalize internal problems by by, for example, having crazy ideas of going war against Syracuse in in, mm -hmm. in Crete, you know, one of uh, in, in in Sicily, that was mm -hmm. one of the key contributors to the fall of uh, or the bad course of war for Athens. So demagogues externalize internal problems to mm -hmm. to uh, places that are far away, and then they fight wars against those places. And, and if you look to the recent history, for example, of U.S., this type of demagogic externalization has happened uh, in, in foreign policy relatively often. So internal problems are outsourced uh, and then fought against and, and, and nothing is gained other than, than loss of life. Mm -hmm. And this actually co brings me to the, the, the larger question with, with relating to your very last thoughts of your presentation that about uh, uh, progress myth and the ideology of, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, basically modernization, prog prog progress and so on. And then related to that uh, uh, is the issue of, uh, of one of the, let's say, great global security political achievements, which is called NATO which is in many places uh, or in maybe most places built up on the idea of deterrence which presumes rationality on the enemy side but if you are talking about uh, basically uh, irrational regression uh, and you used several examples of uh, related to russia as well so what 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 are the consequences for you know nations like uh, Estonia and Finland and others? So if the deterrence doesn't work anymore because the enemy is not rational, so yeah. well, <laughs> that's, a, okay. that's a, a cool. It is a good question. You know, like at what states we are in when we are talking about Russian political regression? It is, it is clear that you know the uh, end of the Cold War ideas of normalization of Russia, liberalization of Russia, uh, democratization of Russia, those paradigms fell. Uh, so the, from that perspective there has been a regressive tendency, although for many Russians the Putin times have been solidifying. But I referred to already that you know in autocratic situations, uh, uh, you know the first years of autocracy can actually Re, uh, lead into a sense that uh, the nation is unified because one group takes over the whole country. So it, it, it is kind of a fantasy of, of power crap that can lead into, into that. So, so the analysis then needs to focus on how deeply is Russia regress, uh, regressed. So how, how encompassing is the uh, prevailing faction or the V group that is in power and how much fear it fe feels for its position. So the irrationality of an autocratic uh, state uh, is a function of the fear that, that the uh, leading group feels about the continuation and sustainability of its power. So if there's a lot of anxiety in Moscow on that issue, 
and of course uh, when it, year uh, stops. Yes. So there's a lot uh, of anxiety, and and we don't know. So uh, so the degree of irrationality. Uh, I, I'm not saying that there's you know there's rational decisions. I mean rational. There's kind of a composite decisions between those, and uh, larger states tend to be more rational than than smaller states. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question uh, uh, well enough. Well, the, the, uh, uh, well enough, definitely, but I don't know whether it got our hopes more. Of. No, no. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, bad, bad omen. You know, when I, I usually talk, I talk about uh, bad things to come. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, here to, to uh, highlight the possibilities that are progressive. And I think. Uh, certain pessimism is warranted in order to produce uh, positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, maybe uh, somebody else would like to continue questions, comments, or so. Uh, I might as well continue with some uh, uh, issues that troubled me kind of. Uh, if you look at the current, you know, aftermath of the, the US election and the, the, the action of, of President Trump, uh, well, some people would say that if something like that would happen in Turkey, nobody would hesitate to call his action good attempt, basically, attempt at that, uh, discrediting the very, very system uh, and, and uh, actually appealing to the very low level common denominator believers of uh, conspiracies and, and uh, uh, conspiracy theories and, uh, and so on. Uh, but in your talk, it seemed to be kind of like self-evident that uh, Trump is ready to leave the palace, uh, but several commentators are not that sure about it. Uh, that that he's, he's not, this demo, democratismus stuff is quite foreign to his thinking, it seems, but uh, uh, how seriously would you consider that actually there is no... <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the legacy of Trump, uh, you know, well, the, the, well, there's two questions I, uh, that Peter uh, you were asking, and I think both are excellent ones. You know, is there there's something going on? You know, is there can Donald Trump still somehow overturn <coughs> the election result? Uh, I, I I would say that the chances of doing that legally are very very narrow, um, but but there, can there be some gimmicks? Uh, and, and how much damage that he wants to perhaps uh, cause to the American political system. He doesn't like it particularly. Uh, you know, he is a businessman from New York, a, construct, a construction uh, business owner who has built casinos. He, for most of his life, he has been on the shady side of law, fighting the establishment uh, through armies of lawyers and, and different other, other networks that he has had. And he is a survivor as well. He knows that he, if he puts on a good game and puts uh, double the stakes on the table, he might actually end up uh, on a winning side more so than we would think. So it's also establishing deterrence against, for example, arresting him on, on January 20th, mm -hmm. uh, which would be, of course, unheard of in, in American politics. So I, I would say that even though there would, would be some crimes clear crimes committed by Trump uh, breaking laws against, for example, nepotism that has taken place. Uh, I, I think that the threshold of, of arresting him uh, is, is very high because actually that would, you know, it would uh, prove him right in a certain way because the elite then arrests a guy who mm -hmm. tried to resist the elite. The trend. He's building deterrence against against uh, anything happening to him or his family. Mm -hmm. But the question of legacy then, uh, I, I think the legacy issue is, is more vital here. For example, the 
TV channels that is is establishing, I think those might be there for a little while. They might die, die rather soon without Donald Trump being president and without, without the, you know, the commander in chief tweeting directly to his people. Uh, but one, uh, one uh, political movement that I think we are going to be seeing in the future quite more and that unites the left and the right is the uh, uh, Q Anon uh, type of, of conspiracy theory. You know, conspiracy theories that are much more developed into, into kind of quasi-ideological movements uh, uh, that, that uh, unite quite a lot of people, seem to uh, be entertaining enough to give a people a, a time to, to, to do something politically, you know, kind of a dropping those packets, for example, you know, mysterious packets are dropped to the followers and then the followers open them up and, and they try to make sense of the world based on the uh, the codes found within, uh, um, you know, that that type of political political becoming uh, to agree that that they lack obvious uh, uh, obvious uh, rational content. Uh, that, that's one of the legacy I, I think of Donald Trump and those those movements are powerful and they can be also used by by actors. Uh, QAnon has been used by Russians, has been uh, provoked, incited by, by Russians, but other actors can also join in. So, so kind of a crowdsourcing of elect democratic meddling is something that is, uh, is happening. So it's not done by some, some intelligence service somewhere, but it is crowdsourced and people are, are let into a flow state when they go through the materials, the craziness of irrationality, the anti-epistemological irrationality of, of the packets that they receive, entertain them enough and they have certain attraction. Uh, and that could be one of the legacies uh, that we are going to see more and more of this, uh, this type of movements that, that now when, for example, the COVID vaccination is going to start these this anti-vaccination movements that are QAnon related, QAnon related might gain power more political power than we think. They already won in one congressional district in the US, so they got representative through to the US Congress, uh, but, but, but they have more influence than that. That could be one of the legacies of, of Trump. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we still have like 10 or so minutes left uh, so would anyone would like to join her or discussion who hasn't had a chance to comment hmm. silence is a uh, agreement uh okay uh maybe if, if <laughs> it seems uh, kind of awkward that the uh, moderator is, uh, I'm, I'm usually this moder modest moderator who tries to avoid uh, overwhelming the discussion uh, with his questions, but, but, but I would uh, <clears throat> ask about then the, the, the approach you have in a sense that it, it seems to offhand, it seems quite awkward to take the uh, people from millennia ago as your methodological or theoretical sources in a sense uh, you, new classical kind of approach to the since I'm not that well versed in the international relations traditions so how common is it that people are actually using those kind of um, as, as you even mentioned that kind of like an anachronistic approaches uh, from the ancient Greek kind of uh, days to the contemporary globalized societies uh, and, and so on. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree that it is something, it is of course a research strand, a particular strand that, that is very much present in international relations. Uh, you know, this, um, especially 
when we are talking about uh, major powers and their way of seeing international relations, the classics are very much used, not only in the US, uh, but also in China. You know, quite a lot of uh, appeals to, uh, to ancient Chinese classics in this respect. You know, they, they seem to provide insight a particular translation of power politics, power that is in many times very mysterious and still, you know, very difficult to comprehend by modern political science. What is power and different types of, of powers, a very old debate. And then if you combine that confusion on the nature of power and, and you know, different types of structural institutional uh, 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 powers. If you combine that confusion with, with uh, the confusion when it comes to uh, policy relevance, when it comes to, uh, to progressive uh, policies, then, then perhaps uh, the attraction towards the ancient writers uh, grow because they, they have used uh, kind of the, they, they have understood the, the nuances of regression better than the modern authors. Huntington, Samuel Huntington, uh, you know, he used to write also good stuff. Uh, not, I'm not referring to the 1990s books that he wrote that everybody is usually referring to when they are talking about Samuel Huntington, but Samuel Huntington had a long career, illustrious career. And uh, he was um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very good book on, 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 on war. He wrote uh, 1965 that when it comes to regression of political communities, perhaps the most relevant ideas are the, also the most ancient ones. And he's especially kind of pointing to the lack in the modern uh, post-behavioral and behavioral political science, uh, lack on understanding of regression and emphasis on, on progressive uh, policies and production of po po progressive policies in a in a cosmopolitan environments. So mm -hmm. this this uh, this critical attitude leaves you different rules than than what you have left if you are critical of that type of a behavioral political science. It leaves you the classics, the neoclassical uh, route, or then uh, it uh, can also lead to more radical theories uh, where regression has been. Viable, a viable instrument in in production of uh, of uh, progressive use through revolutions, and mm -hmm. so, so the West you don't have much left if you you pay uh, pay attention to to only the progressive version of modern social sciences. Uh, however, there are exceptions to that. You know, like Fukuyama's uh, Fukuyama's latest books on 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 on, on regression. Uh, there's quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, studies on wars uh, and how war is produced, um, causation of war. Uh, but, uh, but, um, but one route is this neoclassical route, and I find it myself appealing. It's there's a personal connection to, to Thucydides in the sense that when I was studying at, at Cambridge University, when I was doing my PhD in, uh, in, in, in um, late 90s, uh, uh, you know, Cambridge University offers quite a lot and, and they have great library there and, and I managed to find this book that I didn't know existed and I read it, reread it and then uh, became uh, very, very much uh, in, uh, in depth to, to Thucydides <laughs> from this perspective and what appealed to me most was the kind of the loss of memory, the shared memory and I was studying back then ideas of memory, uh, political memory, and how that is created, and, and what is the role of political memory, and, and, and perhaps the theme of political memory also takes back to, to the classics very easily. So in a, in a sense that uh, uh, the issue of non-linearity seems to be, you know, uh, Getting on the uh, on the focus, and for that we have to go uh, go back to the roots where the you know the myth of linear linear development was not invented yet. It's sort of like a strange that 
similar developments uh, with different vocabulary can be <coughs> seen in in all yeah. sorts of social sciences. And Peter, I, I think we have been talking, uh, you know, the, you know, Bruno Latour, yeah. you know, yeah. famous uh, f uh, French sociologist, who, whose basic claim has been that we are medieval. Mm -hmm. You know, that we have this illusion of progress, but actually when it comes to our political constructions, uh, they are very medieval, they are ancient in a way, because uh, perhaps we are missing uh, important ingredients uh, when we are only focusing on, on the facade of progression, that underneath there, like what Birgit was pointing out, you know, like the existence of structural injustices that uh, we don't realize those because we are kind of uh, infatuated by the illusion of progress so much that we don't understand our medieval nature uh, mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, okay, so... Um, and Morelis has also commented on that here and then related to the yeah, various other... Uh, other, other the strands here that basically take this nonlinear kind of approach to democratization or, or consolidation of democracy or something like that. And, uh, and it's kind of like um, maybe an issue that uh, in other forms of this, this rediscovery of the very classic political theory, maybe something that uh, is not so pronounced uh, in in, uh, in other other branches of political science compared to international relations. Maybe well, we we have those non-linear kind of approaches, but uh, I don't see any discussion of Aristotle or Plato or you know, <laughs> Thucydides uh, uh, in that that sense. sense so. <laughs> yeah, well, well like, one one thing that you know, like I have been trying lately to unify. Kind of the embodiedness and embodied knowledge type of literature with Thucydides, because he talks about kinesics, kinesis, mm -hmm. and kinetics. You know the feeling when when things speed up or slow down, and uh, and regression is a sense when when the kind of the downwards movement is speeding constantly up. So you feel that in your body, in a political body sense, and, and also in the, in the more somatic body sense, for example, in the case of the plague of Athens. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, kind of a unifying that kind of a sociological political science uh, strand that or turn that is now nowadays relatively fashionable in IR with this neoclassical approach. That can also be one way out of perhaps this dichotomy between between the modern and the classical. That the classical classes, cla cla classical ones can uh, learn, real uh, reteach us how the frames, the original frames, were formed, and perhaps the embodied nature of those frames can then be highlighted more. So, but unfortunately, you know, this is not a, uh, work on critical IR. It is a relatively classical topic of external influence. On 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 uh, inside democracies, uh, so it can uh, can be read as a relatively dull work, uh, but there's uh, quite a lot of seats there for the next work that I, I can reassure, reassure you is going to be more, much more critical and interesting. Okay, great to hear that. So there's critical stuff going yeah. to be. That was all very boring. <laughs> <laughs> Better luck next time. <laughs> Yeah, and now it's on record. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyone for the final question, maybe, uh, or comment? Uh, if not, then maybe we can call it a day. And, uh, and thank you very much, of course, uh, Mika and everyone who joined us today. So, I don't know, let's have a virtual applause to each other. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and... Uh, I go uh, and drink a uh, beer or something afterwards. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot do that together. Yeah, that's like, uh, let's meet uh, nine o'clock after COVID. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. That, we will never know. April, <laughs> April, May time frame. So we can have a summer school or something like that. Yeah. Okay. And also, I'm just mentioning uh, in advance that our next research seminar will be uh, in uh, a couple of weeks uh, on, on December 2nd, when we are talking about uh, quite a different research, so suicide research by Professors Nekestisov, Kairi Vernik, and uh, Peter Vernik. And you are all, of course, uh, warmly welcome uh, 